Hello and welcome back to the Tectonic Takes podcast. I'm one of your regular hosts, Ivan Ornelas, and with me making his second appearance on the Tectonic Takes podcast, we have Jesse Morales. How are you doing? Pretty good, man. Thanks for having me again and uh, got lots to talk about today. Yeah, lots to talk about. So I'm happy to be with you today, Jesse. Uh, we sh- share a lot in common, not just Quakes, being Quakes fans, of course, and a love of Pokemon, but specifically the Pokemon species Slowpoke, with who I relate to on a spiritual level. Yeah, man. Um, <laughs> I love that picture of a slow, uh, Slowpoke trying to evolve himself to a Slow King. So yeah, I was like, he's a little slow, kind of like me. So <laughs> that would be a perfect Pokemon for me to collect. So yeah, there you go. Uh, holding the King's Rock, it's just a perfect uh, symbolism of like, anyone can have their day and achieve greatness right and that's the quakes right now <laughs> yes uh when the san jose earthquakes messed with fc dallas the bull did they get the horns well this bull ride ended in a stalemate the western conference race for playoff spots is heating up and this was one of the first couple of games uh, the quakes need to win to vault themselves up and really make a stronger challenge for that seventh spot um FC Dallas is the Ajax of MLS. As you can see from their lineup, they had five homegrown players that started this game. And the latest of their shining young talents, uh, Ricardo Pepe, was the spark that ignited the USA to beat Honduras in World Cup qualifying. And he earned them a point today with their with the equalizer. What do you think of Ricardo Pepe? Oh, man, he's pretty much all the hype that he's um, been getting right now, especially since his last start with the U.S. Uh, squad. So I knew he was going to be a threat in this game. And first half, they did a good job with containing him. So I was getting my hopes up a little. I was just like, all right, <laughs> right. you know what? Uh, after Obviously, after that penalty, Dallas did not want to let go of the gas pedals, so, though. It was attack after attack. But um, I feel like our defense really held up in, in that first half. But uh, something about that second half, I'm not sure if it was just fatigueness or um, they just got lucky because after seeing replays, uh, there was one in particular, it was very slow and it was only one shot or one replay, I should say, um, but it looks like Pepe's goal was deflected off Nathan, um, but I'll have to take a second look, but I do think it was deflected and that just unfortunately caused the bad bounce in Marchinkowski. I feel like if it wasn't deflected, he would have caught that, but it's the way she goes, and uh, Pepe got his header, and he's he's been on fire. All right, yeah, Ricardo Pepe has been the spark for club and country as of late. Uh, he, we did contain him in the first half, and it was perhaps wishful thinking to get two halves without him getting a goal or an assist the way he's been playing lately. Exactly, and the squad around him like really showed up. Um, one of the people that really impressed me was uh, Justin Shea. Uh, I know he's had about a a couple of matches and today he just kind of shrugged that all off. And he, I feel like he was their second best uh, player for tonight. Yeah. Uh, Before we get into the lineups, uh, we are recording this podcast uh, after the game and it was of course played and we are recording now on September 11th, which is the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks from of course, September 11th, 2001. It's, one of the biggest events that has happened in our lifetime for very sad reasons. Thousands of people lost their lives that day. Several heroic first responders prevented further loss and the country was shook to its core. A lot of changes were made to our society. A lot of, unfortunately, uh, Muslim people or people perceived to look like Muslim or Middle Eastern people were treated horribly to the point of, in some cases, murdered because of these attacks uh, as retaliation, anti-Muslim rhetoric was rampant. And we're still healing as a nation. We're healing from the lives lost from the way people were treated, the way our society treats each other. Um, we're still a very divided country. We don't talk a lot about those topics here on this podcast, but I felt it was very important to take a moment to acknowledge that. And hopefully when we look back, on this day 10 or 20 years from now that we can see more uh, of the learning experience and the positive growth and we don't have to be telling too much of these stories of how we were 
people uh, who looked like Muslims were treated badly because of these attacks were we've moved past that without forgetting what has happened in the past. Uh, Jesse, did you want to say something on, along those lines? Um, no, exactly. Um, obviously, it's the 20th anniversary of that tragic day. Um, but what I loved about this nation is that uh, in, in the midst of all fear and um, people being scared from being home, but I, I feel like it really united us even stronger and being able to overcome this uh, tragic event. And 20 years later, you know, uh, I feel like there has been progress made, but, you know, there's still a lot of work to do. As you mentioned, it's a divided country right now, but I do feel like uh, hopefully in 10 years, uh, we, we become that one uh, great nation that the whole world will, will look up to. Yeah, and one last thing before we get back into soccer is being a great nation doesn't mean having to be the best. And that's something that we've been reminded repeatedly by several presidents, including the one before Joe Biden, where you have to have that sense of superiority, that sense of invincibility to be a strong country, to be a strong American, right? whether you are a citizen or not of this country. And that is not the case. We want to have a mutual and healthy respect of people from all countries, from all walks of life, because we uh, all have value to bring to society. And that's something that I believe, at least within our small community here, within Sands Earthquakes and the Tectonic Takes podcast, that everyone is on the same page. And, and I'm very thankful for that. Thank you, man. All right, so now we'll get into the action here in Frisco, Texas, where we have the FC Dallas lineup where they're managed by former Quakes uh, player Luchi Gonzalez, a 4-2-3-1 formation. They had the Brazilian Felipe in goal on loan from Gremio. The back line of Justin Che, Matt Hedges, Jose Martinez, and Ima Tumasi. Then the holding midfielders of Brandon Cervania and Facundo Quinon. You had Jader O'Brien, Jesus Ferreira, and Paxson Pomichol supporting uh, Ricardo Pepe up top. Uh, what do you think of that starting 11 based on, you know, I'm not sure how familiar you are with FC Dallas, but was that what you expected? Any players that st stood out? Uh, yeah, like I mentioned, I, uh, we obviously mentioned it at the <laughs> beginning, Ricardo Pepe, obviously the biggest man, uh, well, could be the biggest man, I'm not too sure physically, but yeah. Um, that header was just beautiful. I mean, it was just something that uh, the only talented players can obviously try and, and attempt. And uh, obviously the, the second name that I mentioned, Justin Che, I feel like he really stepped up his game. And then there was that one play where, I mean, it's just total Quakes defense where they just let him from the their um, defensive end and he would just run through the whole midfield, almost looking like a midfielder forward and then just having a shot on goal. So that was just something that, um, really impressed me and I'm hoping it's more of the same from the San Jose side and um, the third player that really impressed me was um, butchering his name but uh, Su, Su Masi uh, I feel like he played a, a vital role in their midfield yeah it's you're close I believe it's Tu Masi I don't think the Tu Masi. W is pronounced <laughs> yeah I provided phonetic pronunciations for Obreon because it's different from the what you would normally expect O'Brien and then I even butchered Pomichel despite putting his uh name uh I'm gonna try to ingrain in my head it's similar to comical so Pomichel all right I say I say Pomichel like I put a y right after the k and then I'm like oh wait the y's before the k <laughs> yeah that's a good thing about watching these matches is that I trust Anthony Passarelli and Daniel Slayton, so yeah, I think so. we're good from there. Uh, players we saw from the bench include Honduran International and DP Brian Acosta. They uh, brought on Andre Ricarte, um, Sean, like Sean from the Hungarian. Yeah. yeah, his first name is really tough to pronounce, and right. I didn't pay right. as much attention to him as I should have <laughs> in this game. And, and Kosi Tafari, who I really like that they – acknowledged uh on the broadcast that his legal name is in Inkosi uh, Burgess but he wanted to go by his middle name Tafari because he wanted to reject his last name being African-American many yeah. of their last names were traced back to slavery so that is something that more and more African-Americans are doing I think especially in recent years with the MLS Black 
place for change moving. I think that's really powerful representation to see in an MLS player. So that's a really cool story there. Any uh, of those uh, subs that you think changed the game for Dallas? Uh, I wouldn't say too much. I mean, the most it would probably be, I'm going to go on a whim, maybe Acosta, mostly because of just of his uh, current status being the mm -hmm. DP. Uh, but maybe Burgess, um, he he played pretty well at those final minutes, but nothing too striking. I would say it's mostly their starting lineup. Yeah. So yeah, in Kosi Tafari, he was brought on uh, to replace Che uh, as in, who got yeah, injured. The injury. But yeah, that was a even weird then, you saw he that? contributed to uh, the uh, attacking uh, uh, part in the last part of the game for FC Dallas. He earned a corner for them, I think. And sorry to cut you off, Jesse. Oh, no worries. Um, it was that interaction between the coach and the fourth ref. I'm not sure if you saw that. Um, it was an altercation saying, like, it was a dead ball. Uh, I can still make my sub, whereas the fourth ref is like, you can't make the fourth sub. And then it was just a, um, an interesting conversation they were having on the sideline. Rough night for the ref. <laughs> yeah, man. He 33 was fouls to, called. <laughs> he, I feel like he was trying to get a control of the mm -hmm. game, but those players were just not having it. They were just on it, especially. Actually, they were on trophies a lot for the first half. Yeah, uh, I mentioned that the one good thing about Eric Remedy being suspended was uh, he wasn't there to be fouled oh, so right. often as he was this season. <laughs> and I was also thinking in the back of my head, if players can or teams continue to play the Quakes as they normally do, if Remedy on the field, who's going to absorb those fouls? It's like when the kid who gets bullied in school, he's sick that day. Someone else is going to get bullied. Someone and else. that ended up being trophies. Yeah, and I really think it affected his play today. We we were accustomed to seeing this different type of trophies, playing the middle, you know, um, making some great finishes. But today, I feel like with uh, um, the Dallas players being in his in his head, uh, I think it just threw him off today, and uh, it obviously wasn't uh, on to par as we're, as we're used to seeing in the last couple of games for trophies. All right, a few final notes on the FC Dallas lineups. Uh, they were missing six players due to injury, most notably DP Frank O'Hara, who did score for them in their previous game, a 3-2 loss to Real Salt Lake in Rio Tinto Stadium, and their normal starting left back, Brian Hollingshead, who had a foot injury. And they made three changes from that game against RSL. Uh, the aforementioned uh, Hollingshead uh, did not start. He was replaced by Justin Che. Uh, Martinez took Tafari's place and Kenyon for Sergio. And lastly, the five deep, uh, not DPs, uh, they're not into Miami. The five homegrown <laughs> players that started for FC Dallas were Justin Che, Brandon Cervania, Jesus Ferreira, Paxson Pomacol, and Ricardo Pepe. And Pepe's already on the radar for the U.S. men's national team. As for the rest, I won't be surprised if they made a a senior U.S. men's national team appearance within two years. Exactly. Uh, I mean, it's it's so much, so much talent right now, and it's something that I would never have guessed like ten years ago. Ten years yeah. ago, it'd just be like, ah, it's just Landon, Landon Donovan, Michael Bradley, Altidore. That's that's basically our offense. Mm -hmm. And now it's just it's a whole pool of talent. It's really fun to see, and I'm hoping. Uh, it sucks that they're in Dallas, but I do hope um, that they can. Hopefully, you know, make some make some splash in the U.S. squad and I mean, who knows, maybe become a, a starting lineup. Yep. And as for the San Jose Earthquakes, their lineup for this game, uh, Matias Almeida went with JT Marcinkowski, Luciana Bacassis, Nathan, Osvaldo Alanis, Tanner Beeson. Then you had Judson and Jackson Ewell, Carlos Fierro, Chopis Lopez, Christian Espinoza and Chris Wondolowski up top. That was probably the big decision there. Who to start up top with Jeremy Bobasi unavailable due to injury? Yeah, and it's apparent that, I mean, I feel like Wando tried his best, but um, with Espinoza having another off game and um, that header that you will miss is kind of a perfect uh, recap of how his formation has been or um, his current form has been as well just uh, it's just been tough for the earthquakes in these past couple of games missing a lot of players due to either national call-ups or just injuries or suspensions and now we're losing nathan in the next game yep and regarding changes from the rapids game 
Jackson Ewell moved from Cam to center mid to replace the suspended Eric Remedy. Uh, we got Espinoza back, Grant to non 100%, Espinoza perhaps, and that moved Chofis to Cam. And Wondolowski to obviously was a third of that cha those changes. And we didn't have Salinas, who was a surprise because I don't think we knew going into this game that Shea Salinas was unavailable. Uh, we knew obviously it was going to be out due to concussion, and we still don't know the extent of that injury. If he's going to play either for Real Salt Lake or Austin, my hunch is maybe he's ready for Austin. And then we do get some players back. Uh, we missed Jacob Akanyarije for a while with injury. Not necessarily a starter, but he's the next center back in the depth chart if they continue to use Tanner Beeson as a left back. Although I suspect that for the Nathan suspended game, they'll go the more established route of Nathan uh, won't be available. So Beeson moves in the center back and maybe Marcos Lopez if he's ready because he had to uh, quarantine a bit from national team duty to uh, sliding at left back. Nathan's going to be a big miss for the next game. Huge miss, man. And yeah. But I feel like uh, they, they can probably hold on for the next game. Maybe hopefully just uh, one or two goals next game. I mean, it better be a shutout. But I mean, without Nathan, he was just uh, a silly yellow to take in my mind. I mean, time wasting. That's just something that uh, it's got to be on the coach to be a little more strict on his players. I mean, uh, now you're going to be losing Nathan, and now Almeida has to kind of rotate the the squad again. And I think that's that's a big issue, especially coming down this last few games, especially if you were wanting to get into the playoffs, is that you, you want to have this lineup ready entering into the playoffs. You, you still don't want to keep ro rotating, finding out which player you want to put in these kind of situations. So um, Nathan... He, he's a hell of a player, but man, you gotta, you gotta watch out for those silly yellows. Yeah. You don't see time wasting too often uh, and getting a yellow card for that in the 48th minute. So still 42 you go, Nathan. Exactly. So I was just like, man, now you got another suspension coming. I think this is your second suspension or could be third. I don't even know. Um, probably second. Probably he hasn't been here that the long. second. Yeah. <laughs> too long, but to get two suspensions already, I'm like, ah, Nathan, you gotta, tone it down a little <laughs> i know that you're excited to play but you know we we got a few more games to go on yep and next for the substitutes we saw paul marie come off the bench along with jack skin andy rios benji kakanovic and k carol uh, benji kakanovic is another of those players where we haven't seen too much due to an injury uh, it's good to have him back uh, and i think you're muted jesse yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. It's just yeah, background noises go. in the background. I have my okay. little cousins running around. <laughs> okay. No problem. Just make sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, but yeah, as you mentioned, the the substitutions and, oh man, uh, I really want to see Haji. I have not yeah. seen Haji for the longest time. And when he has played, I mean, he seems pretty good on the ball. He seems to want to dribble down the middle. And that's something we desperately need in the midfield is that central attackers. And I feel with Judson, Remedi, and maybe you they're they're more just defense, especially the way Ewell's been playing, just more back passes, obviously the, the whole trend that's with Berhalter. And I mean, I know there was a comment made by Omeda that says, you know, my squad is getting thinner and thinner. I hope I can bring up more academy players. So I thought this would be a great chance and an opportunity to sub in Haji, but, but hopefully we'll see you on Wednesday. Yep. Some stats for the game. Dallas outshot uh, San Jose Earthquake 17 to 13. They had the shots on target advantage as well, 7 to 2. Uh, a good chunk of them were from Jeder O'Brien uh, straight to uh, Marcin Kowski, thankfully. Possession, uh, Dallas dominated uh, 58%. Uh, they also had the edge in passing accuracy, 79% to 76 for San Jose Earthquakes. A little bit worrying because that means three only three of every four passes are reaching its target. Uh, you'd like to be in the uh, 80s if possible. Exactly. Chance created. Uh, Quakes had one, Dallas zero. Corners were 18. Oh, no, that was the next day. Corners, <laughs> Dallas had eight. San Jose had five. Now, this is the yeah. big talking point here. 
18 fouls for FC Dallas, 15 for San Jose Earthquakes. We're not blameless, but wow, this was pretty bad. Oh, man. When I saw Wando's like, header, I was just like, man, that's just unfortunate. But Ewell's, that should have been a goal right there. I don't know what it was, if he just had a wrong hip kind of twist, but man, it, it was just right there. All you had to do was just tap it with your head and it, it would go in. But somehow, some way, Earthquakes found a way to quake it up and <laughs> miss that goal. Did you see uh, Eric Maxime Chipomoting uh, with that failed goal scored for PSG yeah. one time? That's what it reminded yeah. me of. It might have been worse. <laughs> right? I'm just like, oh, man, this is shades of uh, – I know we get memed out of this, but the Wando miss in Belgium, I'm like, man, this, we just can't shrug that off. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I, I'm glad it didn't happen for Jackson Ewell on the national team. Like, All right. he would never play for the national team nope. again if that happened. And he still yeah. might not uh, because this is a lot of fuel to the fire. But, um, yeah, it still annoys me when people bring up the Chris Wanolowski miss in Belgium because clearly, you know, like, there are other players that were not doing their job either in that no. game. Tim Howard had to break a uh, – 16, record like, since like yeah. the 1950s on saves so where's the defense yeah. but the, i mean these are just the casual fans these are just the troll accounts they're just cherry picking at this point because i mean if we're really gonna go in depth right now i mean the u.s was not playing really well up to that point until they subbed in wando mm-hmm. and then that's when the offense came but you know hey they would have probably lost next round so i mean it would have been a nice moment for wando but uh right now it's time to get him a cup before he retires yeah, it's still possible, but still we'll possible. W- work on getting into the MLS uh, playoffs first. Yeah, but today <laughs> should have been three points. Plain and simple, it should have been three points. And Dallas really pushed for that as well. But um, I feel they're like in the same defense... position as we are. Exactly. So yeah. these next couple games is do or die, literally. So we'll see how, see what Almeida does. Yep. Uh, Earthquakes were unbeaten in seven straight matches against FC Dallas going into this game. And four of those were wins, three of those were draws. Now, after this game, it's eight unbeaten against FC Dallas, but now four wins, four draws. Uh, Nashville currently lead MLS with the most draws, but in terms of Western Conference, we're looking like draw FC. I thought that would be Houston. (laughs) I mean, Houston as well, they have a lot of draws too, but I wonder how many that would require a bit more research. How many of those draws for Houston were from winning positions compared to San Jose Earthquakes? Oh, right. <laughs> oh, man. There's just some games that you're just like, man, we, we could have won some of these games. Like early on against Portland, I think they tied up. And then that 1-0 loss against Seattle, I was just like, these are games that we could have won so easily at the beginning. And who knows? We might be in a playoff spot and holding on. Yep. And – uh, FC Dallas were also desperate for points in this game because they lost their last few home games. Granted, they were against Sporting Kansas City and Seattle Sounders, who they are the top two teams in the Western Conference now. But s- still, like they are probably just as disappointed in their home form this season as we have been. Yeah, definitely. And especially with the talent they have, I feel like they have more, um, I'm not going to say talented, but they obviously have a more um, – Definitely, they have I guess the most potential. It mo- they more have more potential. depth. They have more potential. So yeah, it, it, they're still young. So I mean, same with like Kid Cow. They don't have a thirty-five-year-old wing. No, so <laughs> they don't we have. We love Chase Salinas, but especially that's man, what that they guy's don't been have. Playing crazy lately, so <laughs> it was kind of sad yeah. to not see him today. So, so hopefully he's he's available next game. But if not, hopefully against Austin. But uh. The, yeah, you got to give credit to Dallas. I mean, with the, the stretch they've been into, um, especially with, I think every MLS club has had some players called up. So um, this kind of scheduling is kind of off. And, right. and so it kind of pressures a lot of coaches to kind of rethink their strategies. I know Almeida now has to think about Wednesday. And then even after Wednesday, he has to think about Saturday going to Austin. So um, it's a little tough with the scheduling here in MLS. Yeah, and FC Dallas, they were one of the teams affected probably the most of MLS yeah. by uh, COVID. They uh, were one of the two teams that were not able to play in the MLS's back tournament. So nope. I think they're just glad that that's in the rearview rear mirror and they're 
building for the future at the same time. Maybe they'll sneak into the MLS playoffs. Hopefully not, because that would probably mean the Quakes <laughs> don't. But nope. if they do, you got to watch out. Uh, looking at yeah. you, Portland Timbers, they beat you guys on penalties. That was a very intense uh, MLS playoff game. Exactly. So it'd be interesting to see what they do from now. So, but um, hopefully not Quakes, sense. <laughs> Oh, man. But with Earthquakes, man, they get to... They're going to have some pretty tough games coming up, especially with uh, Real Salt Lake. They're going to be wanting to keep their playoff hopes alive and keeping, I think, are they the seventh or are they the sixth seed? I think, I think right now seed. they're in seventh, but we'll seventh. Go look at the standings a little bit. Yeah, I think they're seventh, and then Minnesota has six. I think they're 31 and 30, respectively. So, I mean, Wednesday is going to be the same for earthquakes. You know, they're, they're going to start clawing it, and we'll – see how they do against austin um obviously they're last place so i mean you can't really knock them down either because they're an expansion team in their first year so uh, yeah we tied with them in their last game so we'll see if we can steal three points yeah so the this game could have been changed perhaps if they were able to do a bit more with the free kick they had in the 27th yeah. minute. Uh, Alani was able to beat the wall, but it wasn't quite enough to beat Felipe, the goalkeeper. Yeah. And then after that, uh, Quignon had a header that flies just over the bar. Uh, O'Brien had a few chances. Uh, JT Marcinkowski had to make a big save around the 40th minute mark. Chofi started to rack up the fouls against him, and it was just looking like an uphill battle. The one good thing that I could say is that they were able to close out the first half. Uh, the defense was breached shortly into the second half, but there was a couple of times this season where the Quakes did concede a goal, like sometimes even the last play of the first half. So taking the pauses out of this game, like that is one thing that I'm happy to not see happen. Exactly. And it's, it's always the same every game. I, um, I stream it with my friend. Mm -hmm. And we're just sitting there and he, he's like, oh man, how many minutes are they going to add? Are they going to add like eight minutes, Three, 10 minutes? Three, four. Like they usually, <laughs> yeah, so when we saw five minutes, he's like, oh boy, this Ooh. is, this is going to be tough. And so mm -hmm. whenever the opponent has the ball, we're just like, oh man, they're going to find a way to get into our net, aren't they? And uh, mm -hmm. luckily they were able to hold off for a point. I mean, yeah. I'll keep saying it. This should have been three points, but. I guess we'll take the point with the today. quakes. It's like every time you're playing like a two minute drill situation, it's like the other team has Tom Brady I'm thinking to Thursday night, there was like a minute 24 left on the clock and Tom Brady still marched yeah. his team to the other end zone and Buccaneers were able to sneak past uh, the Cowboys right. there. Like, Thankfully, yeah, I was yeah. about to say last Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully uh, the quakes learned one lesson, but one lesson that, you need to learn the hard way is that Ricardo Pepe is a beast. And he Justin Che is. did really well in the buildup. He sprinted across his side of the field. He was able to set up the cross and Pepe expertly timed header, expertly placed with the power and the precision. And it's 1-1. And my thoughts were, crap, we conceded a goal. But as a U.S. men's national team fan, I'm thinking, this is what they're missing. Like, Josh Sargent isn't doing this. Uh, Jesse Zardi doesn't do this. So, like, yeah, yeah. I'm and on board up. the Pepe train for the starting striker right now. Yeah, and he's – he's. I think he's going to continue his hot form. And I do believe that Dallas is going to be one of those opponents that we have to look out for, especially um, if we're looking for a, a playoff spot right now. So, right now, the way things are, I think they're probably going to take the six or seven seed. Right now uh... – I'm looking at the rest of the second half, and both teams had missed opportunities. Sean had a lot of goal to shoot at, but he took too much time allowing the Quakes defense to recover. Then you had Cade Cowell. He made some brilliant runs. He sets up Kikanovic. The last pass is cut out by uh, Tomasi, and then he suffers a ca calf cramp just trying to keep the ball out of danger. Um, there is a late foul call as well where he's just for uh, – he pretty much won the ball fairly from Andy Rios. The ref bailed him and the Quakes out and deemed it a foul. But yeah. in the spirit of Rios positivity, and <laughs> this will be needed because there's a very not friendly uh, Andy Rios related no. fan question later. Uh, 
if he's going to do one thing right in the last few games, this is what he did right. He controlled the ball from an FC Dallas free kick. It was in the Quakes defensive third. He had a great first touch. He started the last counterattack of the Quakes that led to a free kick. And that's great. But where is this attention to detail for what you're meant to do? Score goals. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Like when I saw him slide tackle, I think that this was when Dallas was going on for the attack. I see right. him like slide tackle. I'm like, whoa, who was that? And then I'm like, wait, that's Andy Rios. What's he doing all the way there? And oh man, as soon as he subbed, uh, Matias Almeida was subbing him, and I'm like, oh, here we go. Poor man's and, Bobby I think Firmino. our fan base is, right? <laughs> yeah, it's just, I mean, it might, be, I'm, I still hold on to his little trading card here just for good luck. Um, so I'm just like, one, one of these times he's going to shut you guys up. And um, whether it be because of the money, I'll be like, that, that's all Jesse Pirinelli. He's the one that negotiated that contract. So don't blame it on him. So when Andy <laughs> Rios like- scores a goal for the, at some point in the rest of the season, if that happens, I will cheer as if a Dodgers fan is witnessing a Cody Bellinger home run. That's how big of a slump right. these two players are for their respective trades. Uh, Andy Rios, like, we know you're on this roster for a reason. Like, yeah, we and need you. We need it's, any, all these players to step up, really. Spinoza as well. I mean, I don't know what's going on with him these past few games. Except for when he became a dad, he got that new dad energy and, you know, yeah. was able to score a goal. But then after that, he's gone again. And, I mean, with Rios, it's getting really bad. Like, uh, we were mm-hmm. at the last home game, and when he was getting subbed on, he got a, quite a – quite a few boos out there from the yeah fans, so i'll never boo a player and get so done but i i understand why the fans felt that way and it's just frustration he's taking away um chances from uh in in this game uh siad haji yeah definitely and it's just i'm not too sure i mean you know made might just be trusting his veteran players which is totally understandable i mean you run the risk of of getting your your youngsters just unnecessary yellows like FC Dallas did tonight. Um, so, oh man, I'm really just hoping this guy can turn it around soon. And hopefully by Wednesday, I keep saying it. Next game he's gonna score. Next game he's gonna score. But um, even when he gets the starts, it's just it's just this slump. And I hope he can get it over with because uh, I'm pretty sure it's taking a, a mental toll on him as well. In order to be a, a Quakes commentator, I think part of your job description is you have to be positive in all situations. Yeah. Passarelli and Slayton are as optimistic as you'll find anyone associated with the Quakes about settling for a point in this game. Not saying that the Quakes themselves, they were aiming for a point. I don't think that was the case based on how they played and they were trying for that winner. But they, they kept harping on it's a point on the road and this is usually a good thing, but you two flaws in that train of thought for as much good work as they do. And this is part of their job. Like they want to keep Quakes fans optimistic and reason for them to tune into other games, but you have to be better at home than the Quakes have been this season. And you have to be in seventh or higher by September. Then you can start to be like, okay, we'll take the point on the road. Exactly. Uh, now you just need three points anywhere. It doesn't matter if it's home, away, in Alaska, in Canada. I don't care. <laughs> just win. Uh- <laughs> man, you, you hit the nail on the head there, man. Uh, <laughs> if this was early on in the season and we were winning our road games, you know, it'd be great. But um, it's just this whole mentality where I <laughs> explained it to you. Uh, baby yeah. and it's like we have this mentality where seventh place and sixth place is okay like hey job done we're in the playoffs okay but what about after that you know we never yeah, really then what that when you're step. playing uh, yeah. uh sporting kansas city or seattle sounders I mean, away <laughs> you fail all your penalties <laughs> that was just ah, oh, that was just heart heartbreaking that was there wild so, i didn't expect that to happen both my teams that i support the most uh, sounds earthquakes and manchester united uh they've suffered some of the most ridiculous penalty losses recently uh yeah. getting completely shut out in the quakes of sounds earthquake in the case of sounds earthquakes and then uh having in vrl score all 11 of oh, their penalties man. and then having to rely on david de gea in the europa league so man that, that must have hurt man but hey yeah. today you got uh cristiano ronaldo scoring his oh two yeah that felt years. great 
<laughs> right so it was yeah. just like man it's just like turning back the clock all right and then the last note we have for this game this is the first game trophies has played 90 minutes for San Jose earthquakes can you believe that i know my, my, my friend jokes are around he's like trophies it's almost a 25 minute hurry up and score before you're just like gone for the rest of the game <laughs> or get subbed off but it was fun to see him in the first uh well the full 90 minutes um but like i said it was just that uh that unfortunate bully kid scenario where you know Remedi was there to take all the hits but someone else had it to take those hits and unfortunately it was trophies all right so next uh we have our player of the match decision on the twitter poll that the tonic takes pulled out you can follow us on tectonic takes we uh nominated tanner beeson osvaldo alanis and JT Marcinkowski, but we had a couple people also give trophies a shout. So far in that poll, JC Marcinkowski is leading by a wide margin, but to trophies' credit, he also had a decent game. Uh, I guess what stood out to me the most was that he was getting fouled, but he wasn't necessarily being effective either, I thought, but then he did have some opportunities, and he, he was that spark plug that Christian Espinosa usually is for the Quake, so uh, who was your player of the match, uh, Jesse? Yeah, my player of the match was Alanis. Um, obviously, okay. with securing that penalty goal, a lot of people don't know it's not easy scoring penalties. So, oh no, no. Um, but I think he had like four, four clearances and then a couple interceptions. So he was pretty vital in that defense in the first half and then second half as well. So, um, keeping this young team, this super fast young team, uh, under control, uh, I'll get to give Alanis credit and. I think that helped Marchukowski um, get that positioning that he wanted. And obviously the fans would, would notice those saves at Marchukowski, but you know, some of the little things that uh, Alanis goes, goes greatly for uh, JT. Yep. Uh, I will give JT Marchukowski my player of the match. Uh, Osvaldo Alanis did put the quakes ahead and he is responsible for that point, but I feel JT Marchukowski is also very responsible for that result as well. He made some big saves uh, he seemed confident. He was marshalling the back line more. Uh, he's still very young for a goalkeeper when you think about it in the grand scheme of things. So I think that this is the type of JT Marzinkowski. I think that if we saw more of this season, uh, he could uh, perhaps be that maybe not even in the top three goalkeepers because it's pretty set for the U.S. Men's National Team right now. And Matt Turner has been amazing in amazing. terms of MLS and in general now that he's won the gold cup with the USA, but JT Marcinkowski will probably be uh, more in consideration for certain call-ups and squads. So for now, JT Marcinkowski, just keep doing what you're doing. If you can be this locked in for the rest of the play and not playoffs, the regular season, then the Quakes will have a chance to win every game. Yeah. And you got to give credit to JT. I mean, he, he pretty much, stepped up in a big way i mean he was still starting with uh when our defense was not so great and they were getting scored on like time after time especially against the the brutal seattle game so um he's come a long way i know a couple of years back we wanted to see more of jt and it's great to see him now taking that um starting role so um quakes do a good job uh with their goalkeeper um prospects and uh, hopefully with JT, you know, he continues to grow and hopefully get an opportunity with some bigger clubs out there. Yep. Uh, FC Dallas also posted uh, their uh, man of the match, uh, Pepe, and Pepe. on his jersey, <laughs> uh, yeah, he scored again. So yeah. no, whatever. <laughs> their art department is probably going to get a little bit of a raise for that. Right. For the Fancy League update, are you playing MLS Fancy, Jesse? No, um, I'm oh, the no. opposite. I'm, I'm the on the opposite end of that spectrum. I'm in the NFL fantasy. So, um, <laughs> I've been trying to get into football. I guess soccer yeah. uh, fantasy, but um, I haven't really found a league. I saw the Discord chat about it, yeah. but it was a little too late for that. I was like, oh, next I season at the wrong time. It would have been next season, but um, I'll definitely start doing my research and uh, hopefully beat everyone and become number one <laughs> yeah so right now we we have a four-way tie in the fantasy league andrew who runs el sobrante fc emil 
with St. Wando and Terry and her soccer gods join me in a four-way tie at 17 wins and three losses. Oh, man. Something's got to give between St. Wando and my Martinez Manta Rays, named after my hometown, Martinez, California. We are facing each other this week, so one of us is going to get their fourth loss of the season. Jeez. We'll keep an eye on that. Uh, I don't know why I don't have Ricardo Pepe still on my fantasy team. Uh, I guess I wanted to stick with one... Uh, FC Dallas player and Jesus Ferrer has also been up until this match pretty solid and contributing with goals. So yeah, that yeah. might change next week. <laughs> right. I know for me, I mean, I'm going to be up in the morning tomorrow getting my brunch ready and just looking down at my phone while looking mm -hmm. at the game. So uh, fantasy, fantasy is a lot of fun. So I'll definitely look into some other sports real quick. What's your fantasy lineup for football? Football. Oh man. Well, I got two leagues on that. You can give me uh, one. One? Let me, hold up, hold on. Let me bring this up now. And while you're doing that, I'll talk briefly about uh, some recent results. So World Cup qualifiers uh, wrapped up the last round of games in the international break. Canada crushed El Salvador 3-0. Costa Rica and Panama drew 1-1. No, Costa Rica and Jamaica drew 1-1. Drew Panama also drew 1-1, but with Mexico. Honduras, uh, they were up 1-0, but USA had four unanswered goals to win an important game 4-1. So as it stands, Mexico leads with seven points. Canada, USA, and Panama each have five points. Costa Rica, Honduras, and El Salvador each have two points, and Jamaica just one. So it was very important for USA to get that win uh, to distance themselves from that bottom half pack. You want to be playing with the big boys there, even in this early stage of qualification and picking up points whenever, wherever you can. And Mexico is also doing very good too. They had some close run encounters. Jamaica pegged them back and made it 1-1 before they had to find a winner at 2-1. Uh, Mexico's very last responded. <laughs> yeah, Mexico responded very well to losing both the CONCACAF Nations League and the CONCACAF Gold Cup. While those are trophies that USA have in their cabinet, uh, World Cup qualification is still the most important thing. And right now, Mexico are in the best spot. Uh, where you want anything to else be. to add on World Cup qualification? No, I mean, it, it, you pretty much uh, summarize it. It's where you want to be. You want mm -hmm. to get as many points as early on because it's going to be a long road to Qatar. And uh, right now, the U.S. It doesn't look too well, in my opinion. I mean, I'm a big advocate of, I was trying to say from day one that Greg Bar Berhalter was not going to be a good coach. Nope. Yeah, I mean, in my mind, that he's just a glorified MLS coach who made the cup what once mm -hmm. and, and still lost that game. So, I mean, I, if this was ran in like England, France, and mm -hmm. their fans would Mexico. hear that Mexico that they, this guy got hired because I, I think it's true. It's just that he knows his brother who's the CEO. You know, there'd be some conspiracies running around, there'd be people rioting, most likely. So, I mean, if the U.S. fails again. I mean, this yeah, he's is done. On. Like, he's not. He'll no U.S. coach will survive a uh, failure to qualify nah. for the World Cup. And it sucks about this whole situation with the squad, especially with uh, McKinney. Mm -hmm. uh, just being a little immature, especially knowing the protocols and all that. So, uh, yeah. they still got enough talent to, I feel, qualify. If not, but yeah, uh, what surprises Canada? Canada has been on a roll. With especially mm. with Buchanan, and that he, man, that's another kid. I'm yeah. excited to see that he made it. He made Canada look so good, and I'm like, this is without Alfonso Davies, right? Like, imagine when they have a full, healthy squad with like Akinola, um, Buchanan, and then Alfonso Davies mm -hmm. for most clubs. So they're probably going to be top three if they can get a healthy squad. Yeah, and Canada they finished semifinals in the Gold Cup this summer, so. I think they're the most likely team to finish third. Right now, they're second above the United States, so fair play to them. Uh, moving on to recent MLS results. We had uh, yesterday on Friday, Atlanta beat Orlando 3-0. That was a bit of a shocker for me. Uh, Timbers beat Whitecaps 1-0. And then today, we had a whole lot of action here. Rapids and Galaxy oh, drew 1-1. Sounders beat Minnesota 1-0. A bit of revenge for... Minnesota ending their unbeaten start to the season earlier in the summer. Red Bulls of New York, they beat 1-1. No, they drew 1-1 against D.C. United. 
the New England Revolution, they continue their push for the Supporter Shield, a 2-1 win over New York City FC. FC Cincinnati won a game, but it was against Toronto, so don't get too excited to our friends over at Soccer Crash. <laughs> Just kidding, be very excited. You don't get to see that too often. A 2-0 win over Toronto FC. Toronto, they are looking pretty bad this season. Inter Miami, 1-0 over. Uh... Oh, what the? Got you back. Oh, there we go. So uh, let me just. And then we had Inter Miami. They're starting to pick up some steam with a 1 0 win over the defending champions, Columbus Crew. Defending champions who might not be able to defend their title in the playoffs if they keep this yeah. up. Nashville uh, uh, beat Montreal 1 0, and they go back up to second in the East. Sporting Kansas City beat Chicago Fire 2 0. And Houston Dynamo beat Austin in a battle of the two bottom teams in the Western Conference. Dynamo <laughs> get 3-0 win. Um, one thing I did notice is only four teams, uh, New England, Cincinnati, Sporting Kansas City, and Houston Dynamo, scored more than one goal today. So it doesn't really uh, affect how I feel about the Quakes only scoring one goal today, but at least we weren't the only ones. No, yeah, and I feel like it's that international play coming into into the situation here. So a lot of teams got their players back, but a lot of them are either fatigued or they just weren't in the lineup. So uh, one team to really look out for in the East is definitely uh, Bruce Arena's uh, New England uh, Revolution. They've really turned things around in that club, and it's amazing to see how, how that organization uh, kind of had it to rebuild. Granted, this is still the regular season. We've seen New England Revolution teams in the past. They do great in the regular season, yeah. but they are very snake-bitten. They've lost so many MLS Cup finals. <laughs> and it's going to be a – I'll have to see it to believe it with them at this point. Yeah, and that's what I like about MLS. It's mm -hmm. just the parody. I mean, you, there might be some favorites, but, you know, there's some teams that might be coming in hot, coming into the playoffs, and – might upset and might become underdogs. And that's where I'm hoping the earthquakes fit into that bill. Yeah. So as you can see in the Western conference, so you have these three tiers, essentially we'll put a dynamo and Austin to the back burner for a second. The top tier teams are the top three Sounders, Sporting Kansas city and Colorado Rapids. Then you have uh, kind of in the middle, uh, LA Galaxy and Portland Timbers, they're starting to establish themselves in playoff positioning in fourth and fifth. And then from sixth to 11th, only five points separate those teams. Minnesota United on 31 points, RSL 30, Whitecaps 29, LAFC 27, Quakes 27, and FC Dallas 26. Most importantly, of course, for the short term, upcoming next is Real Salt Lake with 30 points. So if Sands Earthquakes beat them, they'll both be on 30 points, which can be important. Yeah, definitely. Uh, this next game is essentially a big three points because uh, I know we've been talking about it pretty mm -hmm. much since today is that these three points are going to matter because there's not many games left and we're, we're nearing November. And so uh, it's just, I don't know, man, something's got to change with the earthquakes. They always do this to us. They have some mm -hmm. amazing <laughs> Always form. the hard way. Mm -hmm. they, and then something happens and then they have to claw their way into like seventh or sixth place. But We'll, we'll we'll see once we get our full lineup back. Yep. For the Eastern Conference, as we mentioned, New England Revolution, they have a 14-point lead on the East, and they're 10 yeah. points ahead of the Sounders in the West. So unless they just stop caring about the regular season for some odd reason, they're <laughs> going to win the Supporter Shield. Nashville and Orlando, they're in that next tier, second and third, 41 points and 38 points. And then you have New York City kind of po poking their heads out in fourth, and then a similar situation from Philadelphia Union in fifth to Columbus Crew in tenth. There's still a lot of movement that can happen there. Those games are going to be very important. Um, for the teams that are just below the playoff line, Atlanta United, Inter Miami, and Columbus Crew, these are all teams with – ambitions to make the playoffs so Especially it's going to be very disappointing <laughs> if they don't make it happen and for the teams in the bottom of the east uh they're the ones that are definitely rebuilding right now 
uh, New York Red Bulls are still figuring out their identity. Uh, Chicago Fire always seem to be rebuilding. Uh, Cincinnati and Toronto, yeah, it's not great, but oh, we'll see yeah. what the rest of the conferences that are in the playoff conversation have to offer with uh, a little under uh, two months left in the season now before playoffs. Yeah, and it's gonna be it's gonna be fun to watch, especially in the East, how how things will shape up. Obviously, the favorites right now, I guess, to make it out of the East is the New England Revolution, but you never know. I mean, maybe Inter Miami can find a playoff spot and their stars can finally shine and you know make a statement that hey, you know, we're not here to to be on the beach all day. You know, we want to win. So <laughs> it's good to see uh, David Beckham. I guess a little sign of relief. He's like, oh man. I thought this money was going to go to waste, but let's see what happens at the end of the season for them. I'm excited to see um, how they play out. Yeah, and then I'll just pick out a few of the upcoming MLS and CONCACAF games c- coming up that I'll be interested in. I'll keep an eye out tomorrow night when LAFC take on Real Salt Lake. That'll be a bit of a scouting mission because Real Salt Lake will then play three days later against us. And we'll see what LAFC can do and if we can take anything from that game to apply to our matchup against them. Then we also have uh, uh, New York City versus FC Dallas is going to be the key MLS game on September 14th, which is a Tuesday. But some eyes will also be on Seattle Sounder versus Santos Laguna in the League's Cup. Uh, In both the League's Cup and the CONCACAF Champions League, we're down to one MLS team in both yep. so a little bit of pressure on the sounders potentially a lot of bit of pressure on philadelphia union because on Big wednesday pressure. they're down 2-0 uh on aggregate against club america and while philadelphia union will be at home for that game club america they score home in a way effortlessly uh, they're one of the best teams in Liga Americas, which makes me barf as a Chivas fan, but it's <laughs> unfortunately the truth. That game will be on 6 p.m. And then it's going to be fun to watch. Yeah, it's going to be fun to watch. Uh, 7 p.m. that day as well. I'm looking forward to Portland Timbers versus Colorado Rapids. I think that's going to be a good one. Uh, if we'll mix in an Eastern Conference game in there, 4.30 on Wednesday, September 15th, you got Orlando City versus Montreal. Uh, two very uh, up and down teams there that yeah, I think have Montreal. a lot of talent. Yeah, Montreal are an enigma. Yeah, I think they're in a situation with their um, supporters that they closed off their section or something like that. I haven't really right. read up too much, but man, that club uh, since their coach left, it's just been downhill. Yeah, and lastly, to wrap up the upcoming games, uh, Chicharito is now healthy, so he's probably chomping at the bit to. Uh, get a goal or two against Houston Dynamo when LA, when LA Galaxy hosts them that same Wednesday. And then the other uh, uh, CONCACAF uh, League's Cup matchup is Club Leon versus Pumas. And then that Thursday, September 16th, uh, you have Monterrey, who have a 1-0 aggregate lead, take on Cruz Azul in Mexico City for the leg two of that semifinal as well. Uh, any thoughts on any of these games? Uh, the Monterrey versus Cruz Azul is going to be fun. I, yeah. I know there's a lot of fun games out there, but I think this one in particular is on my on my radar, mostly because games are very different in the Azteca. I mean, oh, yeah. we, we've seen it time and time again. I mean, whether it's national or Champions League games, um, it's a completely different atmosphere. It's kind of cheating in a way where... <laughs> both a little polluted and thin air so it plays in the favor for america because they practically they live there so you know they're used to the the environments but we'll, yeah. we'll see what cruz azul does i feel like they'll be able to come back maybe win 2-1 if they win 2-1 then i think champ uh away goals still applies in Concacaf. so on the ray we go through yeah i mean <laughs> they'll win yeah. the game but we'll see what happens from <laughs> yeah. if they are able to score that extra goal so up next for the quakes uh Real Salt Lake, as we've said several times already. Then Saturday, three days later, on the 18th, they go to Austin for another 5 p.m. game. So we'll be recording the next podcast at a similar time as we are now. And 
Wednesday, September 29th, and uh, I skipped September 25th. So we have LAFC on September 25th at home, still at home for Wednesday, September 29th against the Seattle Sounders. And then with six games in October and the regular season finale uh, again versus FC Dallas, this time at home at the start of November, you're really starting to see the finish line. And yeah, just as some people do for NFL schedules, you think, okay, that's going to be a win. It's going to be a loss. We need to win <laughs> that one. We might win this one. That's kind of the calculus that we're starting to do here with uh, sounds of earthquakes, but we'll take it not just a game at a time. We'll go two games at a time. Uh, Real Salt Lake in Austin. So I feel like this is a better Real Salt Lake team than the one who collapsed at the last minute when we faced them last time at Rio Tinto Stadium. And with Austin as well, I think they were able to get a draw when we last visited them in their home opener of the season. So I think it's going to be very interesting to see what these two teams offer them. I don't think you can underestimate either of them. My biggest question for these games is, which positions do you think will see the most rotations or otherwise tactical decisions to uh, accommodate the tight fixture schedule? Uh, It's going to be the midfield position. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's going to be, I mean, the midfielders have the most important role in how uh, the game is dictated as far as speeds, as far as like formations, Uh, are we going to play on the wing or are we going to play through the middle? Uh, I know with today's game, they tried playing through the middle. And then at the second half, they went with uh, Kikanovic and Cowell mm-hmm. with the wings. So I guess Almeida is going to have to make a decision for Wednesday's game. Uh, I feel like that's going to be, a, I'm going to take, I'm going to go on a whim and say it's going to be a high scoring game, both sides. And then with the FC Austin game, it's probably going to be more defensive and maybe we'll, we'll get a shout out and a win there. Uh, I'm predicting a 1-0 win with Austin. All right, so with Real Salt Lake, the the danger man is definitely going to be Albert Ruschnack, and he was able to get the eventual winning goal against FC Dallas in Dallas's previous game before this one. I think he's a very important player for how they operate uh, in that midfield, and got to look out for Rubio Rubin as well up top. He's starting to not necessarily – full-on revive his career in the sense that he's going to once again be in the national team radar, but he's looking very solid at this level, at least. Let's not go for another bicycle kick. (laughs) (laughs) Oh man, that was an incredible goal. That was a banger. Yeah. And then as for Austin FC, I think that one thing to look out for is that they do have a player in form as well. Uh, His name is, uh, I believe Sebastian Driussi. He's one of their Argentine players that they got him from, I believe, the Russian League, or one of those leagues in that part of the world. And he plays as a number 10. He's a great uh, partner for uh, Cecilio Dominguez. And of course, Diego Fagundes, he's been in the league for a while. He was part of one of the better New England Revolution teams from last decade. So I think it's going to be another uh, offense that we have to keep in check. And then in goal as well, they have Brad Stuver, who got a lot of calls to be an all-star because of how busy he has been as the goalkeeper for Austin and keeping them in game. So he's going to be tough to beat as well. Definitely. I mean – Man, this has been interesting these past few games. Um, The Real Salt Lake, not too sure, honestly. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. So basically, you just have to get it done. I think you have to find a way to win. It doesn't matter if you're playing Real Salt Lake or Seattle Sounders. It's just that mentality you have to have, and you have to be prepared to do what you have to do. They need a leader. I mm -hmm. mean, Wando's obviously a good veteran player, but – I think it's time for him to to give the captain's armband to someone he thinks that can lead the team to to that next level. And I, I feel think we're like, still auditioning. I think he's still auditioning yeah. players for that armband. And you yeah. know, we'll see what happens next season. It could be anticlimactic, and he just hands it off to his buddy Shea Salinas. But most likely, we'll see. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, this this locker room really needs a leader. I mean, 
Espinosa used to be that DP role where he would just come in, get the assist, maybe a goal here and there, but now we're just really without a, a striker. And I hope maybe Ebobisa might be that guy where he'll lead the team. He'll be able to uplift some players, you know, uh, but again, it's just, it's going to be tough these few games and I hope they can, they can find that identity once more and um, be that family that Almeida always likes to talk about. You get the good cop, bad cop routine. I think Wondolowski and Salinas, they're like the chill forces. They're encouraging. And then Matias Almeida, he expects a lot out of these players and he's going to encourage him and them and more. Maybe, I'm not sure aggressive is the right, right word, but he's going to be very vocal. And yeah. I think sometimes you need that duality within your players. When I think of old Manchester United teams, uh, you maybe have like Wayne Rooney, who was the more aggressive, he was the bad cop in that situation, and maybe Paul Scholes. And then in Chelsea, you had Frank Lampard and John Terry. Uh, yeah. John Terry was perhaps a bad cop for other reasons, but <laughs> um, yeah, but is you know you need that balance and i think right now the sands earthquakes something about the mix of personalities they have maybe that's something that needs to be explored in the off season as well like what can this collective do to raise their game and if it it certainly does need some changes i think regardless of how well they do the season there needs to be activity in the transfer window, but we've said that for the last 10 years oh, or something. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, man, it's the same with our owners. Like, hey, when are you going to open up your wallet? But no, you, you pretty much, uh, I've said it, maybe this offseason, they're really going to start looking at that kind of role. Uh, I feel like Chris Leach yeah, has a good understanding of the MLS, and uh, I feel like he's probably top three right now in that consideration for mm -hmm. the GM role. But uh, a little off track, this is kind of like the San Jose Sharks where – they let go of a longtime Sharks player, Joe Pavelski, mm -hmm. and he was Jumbo a captain. Joe. So he was the best captain you can have in the locker room. Just having that that presence, you know, you were able to give it a year 100%, and he'll have your back. But ever since they let him go in free agency, Sharks kind of lack that identity, and now they're suffering for it. And, you know, you still got high-end players making high salaries, kind of like uh, Andre, Andy Rios, but they're just not producing – and it's just that loss of identity. And I think the earthquakes are in that position where we're, we're nearing the end of the Wondolowski era, the Shea Salinas era, you know, the last of the Goonies. And now I feel like it's time to turn the page and see what we can do now. I apologize to all you Sharks fans. Joe Thornton is Jumbo Joe, but I love them both. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, they both left, so you're good. <laughs> yeah. Uh... One's in Miami, one's in Dallas. Yeah, man. Uh, let's get into the fan questions then. Uh, thank, and I want to also thank, I know I mentioned them on Twitter already, but thank you to Osvaldo, Jeff Mulvihill Jr., Joseph Estevez of EMI Sports Central, Luis Velasquez, and Calvin for providing fan questions for the previous podcasts when I had Abby Rose as our guest. Unfortunately, we didn't have time to go through them, but I did answer them on Twitter at Tectonic Takes. I gave you all shout outs. Hopefully you enjoyed the answers there and in the future, uh, continue to send questions and we'll get to them uh, next time, I'm sure. Uh, this time we got a few questions from some different sources today. Um, a bit of one at Brochar asked, how did Jackson Ewell miss that? And exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we were going to ask the same question. Like, dude, you should have just tapped it in. I don't know what it was. It was just your hip. Maybe the way you kind of jumped. I mean, I don't know. Maybe they need some training from Ronaldo on how to jump on those headers. All right. Kevin Catano at Real Catano asked if Espinosa is carrying a slight injury and how was Che allowed to run 50 yards with the ball to set up the goal? Yep. And I think that's still the case. Espinosa is not 100%. And I think that's something that he's going to have to work on because he, maybe he's not getting as fouled as much as Remedy, but he is uh, an easy target because other teams, like, they've seen the scouting reports. Espinosa has been around the league a few years now. He's their main creative force. He's going to be responsible for crosses in the box, making runs on the wings, and they know that they need to stop him by any means necessary to really limit the Quakes' attack because 
it relies on him to a significant degree. So yeah. I think Christian Espinoza has to be prepared to get fouled a couple times a game. And we just need him on the field as much as possible. It's, you know, tough to go around that. It's really tough, but um, I mean, I wouldn't even be surprised if he has an off season uh, surgery for maybe, maybe something that's been hampering him, whether it be shoulder leg, but mm -hmm. I mean, he, Ah, man, I don't, I'm not too sure what's going on with him. I feel like he's gotten slower as well. Regarding uh, Justin Che's 50-yard uh, run that led to that goal, uh, this is also a relevant question. Gildan Stern on Reddit wanted to know our thoughts about Quakes having trouble breaking the press. And I think sometimes the Quakes do have a tendency. They're a little bit too relaxed, both offensively and defensively, in their own third. We've seen them play at the back hundreds of times this season, and it's weird. It's like seeing Burnley do that. Like, <laughs> we don't really have the players to play out the back too much. The center back surely can, but I have concerns Midfield. about other players, and it's just asking for trouble in MLS in particular. You can get away with it more in some other European leagues where – the press isn't as common because you're doing more running in certain areas and there's different styles of play. So that doesn't really play into your favor, but in MLS, like they are on you 24 seven. It's not just the quakes doing man to man. Uh, other players are confident in their abilities to win the ball high up the pitch and they're going to punish you. And quakes on the other hand, in the case of this Justin Che run, they Backed off and backed off of him too much, and they were probably not expecting Ricardo Pepe to do what he did, even though he's a poacher and a determined finisher. Uh, I think the easiest answer after all that rambling would be that Quakes switched off in that moment, and it's really frustrating because. All it takes is one moment. Quakes yeah. score a goal game. They concede a goal game very often in this season. So if you're going to only score one goal a game, then you cannot afford to switch up even for that one moment. That one moment, man. And I just feel like they were just ball watching. They were just like watching him run. And I'm like, are you guys going to do anything? Are you guys going to pressure him? Like, or are we just going to let him go into our own box and try a, a shot on goal? And that's exactly what happened. The worst decision you can make is indecision yeah and oh man I'm, i hope almeida gives him a stern talking about that he's like you cannot let him do that a center back should not be able to go from end to end that easy full back but still right <laughs> yeah uh poppy drew 10 on reddit asked why is rios getting paid 1 million and the answer is to make a expert clearance and start the counter attack from the opposing free kick because that's the only thing he did this game right i mean if you're going to talk about the salary i mean just blame it all on jesse fiorinelli he's the mm -hmm. man that that negotiated this contract and he felt like all right yeah we'll take you in for a million dollars i mean if you're a player you're going to be wanting the best possible salary i mean if i was going to play for the earthquakes i want the most money um, unless you're Shay, I got him. I got a chance to meet him uh, during our autograph signing. And he's like, uh, I asked him the question. I'm like, how many more years, Shay? And he's like, shoot, as long <laughs> as they pay me, I'll keep playing. And so I'm just like, ah, I'll respect that. But there are some players out there who are still looking for their big paycheck before before uh, their mid thirties come in. <laughs> Andy Rios took advantage of that, so he he kind of finessed uh, Jesse Pirinelli there. Yeah, I've seen Shay Salinas' Facebook uh, pictures. He, he, he's got to make sure his family's taken care of. <laughs> yeah, right? He's like, hey, as long as they're paying me, I'll play till I'm 40. I don't care. <laughs> got to get my kid a, a Nintendo Switch. <laughs> right? <laughs> they ain't cheap right now. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, you can't even find the PS5. Uh, nope. And lastly, uh, Griffin Leonard asks, were Matias substitutions tonight the best possible? If not, what would you change? And I think there are two players on the bench that I think could, could have potentially been helpful. I think you got to utilize Syed Haji a bit more op often. Exactly, I yep. think he's been frozen out of the squad for whatever reason, unintentional or intentional. And 
don't understand why. I know there's flaws to his game, mainly that he doesn't pass sometimes when he should. And I think he got unfairly branded as selfish. I think it was more indecisiveness in those situations. And I like what I see from Jack Scan. I think that he there are games where he can be helpful. And one thing I liked about him in this game was he was able to keep fighting in one possession of the ball. He maintained it against two FC Dallas players. So that was probably the most I was I've been impressed from Jack Scan and his limited opportunities uh, so far. Whereas we know what we got with Tommy Thompson. Uh, he's a player that I think he's a utility player, but none of his utilities are being used. We rarely see him as a fullback. We rarely see him as a winger. We rarely see him as a center mid. You can do all of those things. Why not throw in a different look? And I know he's a liability defensively against fast wingers. Don't use him for that, especially don't start him for that. But you can play him as a winger. Uh, some. Right now, I don't see Carlos Fierro as a player who has to play every game. I think some games it'll be helpful to have Carlos Fierro. Some games, maybe give Tommy Thompson a chance. I think yeah. utilize your options. Yeah, and I think with Tommy Thompson, I think he's still injured or something must have happened. He's another I mean, player that's come back from injury. There's a couple of them. Benji Kakanovic, uh, yeah. Jacob Akanya Rije. Man, so We've had a lot of players that especially fringe players like Jacob Okanyarigi. We saw him like maybe two or three times last season and he was in some big games, some tough games. He looked all right. Um, yeah. If he wasn't injured, he could have made a next step in a similar way that Tanner Beeson has, but we just don't know because he's been hurt, but it, it's either him or Casey Wells that are next center backs in the depth chart. So something that we will have to see at some point. Um, yeah. I mean, do you agree? As like, Is any other name that you'd like to see more often from the bench? Uh, I would like to see more Paul Marie. I mean, oh. uh, he's someone that has been playing well when he has the opportunities. Um, I feel like he'll be more, more impactful in the midfield position. I think Almeida, Almeida's playing him in like the right back or left back. Can't remember which. He which can play side. either one. He mostly plays a uh, right back. Uh, right do you back. think he could start a game over Abacasis and you'd be okay with it? I'll be okay with it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, uh, they're, they're pretty much neck and neck on who has the starting role. Mm -hmm. And with Paul Marie, I think he just needs more of that, um, more of those opportunities to get more than just 20 minutes, 30 minutes a game. I feel like he, he can have an opportunity given the right circumstances and given the right um, opponent. And so uh, it, it's interesting to see what Paul Marie um future is with the San Jose earthquake, especially I think with Hodges as well. I, I know he's still young, but it'd be great to see him. He would have been a great replacement for Fierro. Um, haven't really seen too much selfishness. I mean, he's been dribbling the ball as he should because he's playing in midfield. Um, it's probably just for some bad passes, but I mean, you can make the same case for Kate Cowell. I know he's still 17, 18, um, but some of the passes, you know, were just easily blocked by defenders, but obviously given time, he'll grow into that position and he'll make better passes or complete the passes and be able to finish a lot more. But um, I, I can't wait to see Tommy Thompson again. I feel like we've been missing him for quite a few, few games out there. All right. On that note, that'll conclude the fan question segment. Thank you so much uh, from Twitter and uh, right at this time around. Uh, if you're on a discord server, you can always post a question there as well. You can DM either Tectonic Takes or myself, Ivan, on Twitter, or even in the Facebook group, San Jose Earthquake Discussion Group. You can ask a question there on the match day game thread. And for our closing thoughts, you already gave your prediction for the next two games. I'm going to give mine. I am going to predict uh, a 2 1 win for Real Salt Lake. Um, no, a 2 1 win first San Jose Earthquakes over Real Salt Lake. And Finally, a clean sheet, uh, a 1-0 win away against Austin. I think these are probably the more winnable games coming up, but it won't be easy. And I think they just needed to have a fighting chance. I think there's a very real possibility that the Quakes will trip at some of the final hurdles, uh, especially in October where there's more away games. But I think 
they will find something within them to get some positive results in these two games. And since you already gave your prediction uh, for your uh, tectonic take to close things off, uh, fill in the blank. After these two games, Quakes will be in the blank position in the Western Conference. What do you think? All right. So I got a pretty juicy one here. Okay. Uh, they're going to be in eighth place while Dallas is going to be in seventh place. And it's Ooh. all going to come down to decision day. It's going to come oh. down to the last game. It's kind of like a reminiscence of against Minnesota. It's going to be something similar to that. So, so you think uh, after this week, Quakes are going to be in eighth. Dallas will jump to seventh. And you think with all of October and until the final game of the regular season, they'll be in those same spots. Yep, and it's going to be that cliche from MLS decision day. So um, I'm only saying that because I'm going to be at the game. So I'm hoping for a, a pretty good game that last uh, home home stretch for them and uh, be able to secure a playoff spot. So that's my hot take. All right. Well, thank you for coming, Jesse. Uh, hopefully I'll see you at the Real Salt Lake game on Wednesday. And uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you tonight. No, yeah. Thanks for having me again. And um, for every listener, I'm usually in section 111 with my buddy. We're usually cheering on our quakes, whether it be good or bad, you know, uh, we'll we'll be there until until that amazing day when they hoist the cup. Yep. And beyond. Thanks to our sponsor, Roughneck Scarves, the official scarf supplier to MLS, USL and US soccer. Get custom scarves for your group or team at, team at roughneckscarves.com. Tired of the same old uniforms and cookie care templates from Nike and Adidas? Look for a unique, completely custom kit for your youth club, Sunday league squad, adult, or pro team. Icarus of Ski can help you create your dream kit at an affordable price. Let them help you design your new custom kit today at IcarusFC.com. That'll do it from this uh, showdown in Texas between FC Dallas and San Jose Earthquakes. Uh, Coming up next for the Tectonic Takes podcast, I will be uh, recording a post-game podcast at a similar time following the Austin FC game. We're going to talk about both Real Salt Lake and Austin, uh, look at what that means for the Quakes in that table. Will they be closer or further away from the playoffs? Then we plan on having a solo podcast uh, a week from then for the LAFC game. We'll probably record that Sunday since this will be a home game on the West Coast, so It'll be a, a later finish. Then the next two games after that, Seattle and Vancouver, will do another double week uh, podcast as well. And we're also going to plan something for the international break, two somethings. Uh, right now we're talking with Quincy Amariqua. We're going to try to get him on the podcast once again. He was a treasure when we had him uh, last time. He had full so many interesting stories and thoughts that he shared with the world and it was incredible we're hoping from and we're expecting more of the same uh, when we have him on we're going to try to aim for that october international break and then at the end of that break we're going to recap that next slate of three games for the national teams from a predominantly USA perspective, but I, we know a lot of the listeners of the Tectonics podcast follow the Mexican national team closely as well. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about every team's chances of qualifying to the World Cup in CONCACAF with a brief look at other places around the world. And then from there, we'll figure out what our remaining podcast schedule will be for the remainder of the regular season. So that'll do it for tonight. Uh, This has been Jesse Morales and Ivan Ornelas. Go Quakes. Go Quakes.